welcome to this show. Um, it's a very interesting session, I hope, for as many people as possible. If you have a child or you teach in school, um, may I introduce you to uh, Steve Baden, who recently wrote a blog um, and is a retired head teacher. He's going to tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. And also to my colleague Ellie, um, Ellie Matthews, who is our education consultant, and myself is Lavinia Dowling from the M Word, and my trade background is mental health nursing. Steve and Ellie, thank you both very much for joining me today. It does, and again, this is a minefield at the moment because there's there's huge variation in how the guidance is being interpreted, and it's a problem. Um, at school level, but bigger than that, it's, it's LA. I mean, it's LAs who ultimately issue penalty notices. Schools right. can request them and academies, but it's the local authority that issues the penalty notices. And some local authorities and some trusts for academies have got different policies on on how this works. Some some are saying as a as a blanket rule. We don't authorise mental health absence. We'll only authorise it if you've got this. And sometimes this is a letter from CAMS, a letter from um, Healthy Minds, sometimes a letter from a private mental health uh, professional. Strangely, uh, and increasingly a common one is that some parents are being asked for they say that the child can only be authorised if a doctor signs them off. Now, you'll probably know this. This does not even exist as a mechanism. There, there is no such thing as a child being signed off school. There is no equivalent to an employee who gets a, a fit note. Yeah. Uh, that, that does not exist. And, and I don't know where this came from. I've never asked for one. But it's a fairly recent thing, but I've seen in black and white parents um, have shown me emails and letters they've received from school saying, I've got to have this note. And, and I can only say, well, this does not exist. A doctor cannot give you one ethically, uh, contractually, they, they don't exist. All they can say is, in their view, a child has this condition, but even then, Doctors, qualified medical professionals, the experts, aren't always in a position to say, "I." it's my view that the child should not attend school because of anxiety. Yeah. They, they might say they have anxiety. They might say they're um, consumed with, with the physical sensations of anxiety. But m many GPs won't commit to saying because of this. They're not well enough for school. And I get that because they also wouldn't say it about a broken leg or um, most most illnesses. That that's not their that's not their duty. And interestingly, I saw last week a poster from a, a doctor's and it said, you do not need to ask your GP for these things. And one of them was um, for your child to be signed off school or um, for medical confirmation of your child's illness. So we've ended up in this really bizarre situation where, on the one hand, schools or local authorities or trusts are saying as policy, we need medical evidence. The medical profession is saying, we don't give medical evidence. Parents are saying, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. And, and the system then punishes because if you don't have the evidence, your absences are unauthorised. If you hit a certain trigger, you might get a penalty notice. And this is the absolutely baffling scenario we've ended up in with huge numbers of vulnerable children who are struggling health-wise and therefore struggling to attend school, parents in the middle of a mess. But actually, the guidance, I've brought it up in front of me, um, Lavinia. The document is called, and, and this is worth parents reading, it's, it's a yeah. DFE, but it's from the Department for Education, it's a document written for schools. It's, it's called Working Together to Improve School Attendance. It's guidance. So the DF, you know, as a head, I've read tons of these. The guidance documents <laughs> are supposed to be your point of reference as a school for information. So this particular one, it's for maintained schools, academies, independent schools, local authorities. It's dated May 2022, came into force in September 2022. It's due to become statutory this September, although 
um, it will have been amended. Um, so th this is a 60-something page document covering all the bases that schools need information on. So just while I'm talking, I'm trying to find... Um, oh, so page 43, this is about penalty notices. Bear with me, I'm, I'm going to literally re read what the guidance document says, <laughs> and then I can't be misquoted. Is that okay? Of course, that's amazing. I'm almost there. Page 43 of this document. Okay, so there's quite a few paragraphs. If people look, you can you can just Google the document, you can read the full document. Um, one of the first sections says this fixed penalty notices are served on parents as an alternative to prosecution when they fail to ensure that their child of compulsory school age regularly attends the school where they are registered. That's the first thing. Um, fixed penalty notices can be used by all schools where the pupil's absence has not been authorised by the school and the absence constitutes an offence. So that's something we need to be thinking about in the realm of mental health. Is it an offence? Is it a criminal offence when your child is too unwell to attend school because they're uh, they're having panic attacks or throwing up or self-harming or, um, you know, having intense headaches? Um, fixed penalty notices are intended to prevent the need for court action. This is crucial to this conversation. They should only be used. This is paragraph 131 for those interested. Fixed, uh, fixed penalty notices are intended to prevent the need for court action and they should only be used where a fixed penalty notice is deemed likely to change parental behaviour. That's the first point. And the fixed penalty notice will support to secure regular attendance. And um, where, where it's not been engaged with. So this is very, unauthorized holidays are given as an example. But what I would say to any parent who finds themselves, you know, in a situation where their child is struggling with a mental health condition, and as part of that, they're struggling with their condition, if their absence is unauthorized, firstly, I would, as a parent, I would challenge why they're being unauthorized. And secondly, if a penalty notice is being issued, I would arm myself with this document. I would highlight all the reg relative paragraphs. I would be requesting politely a meeting with the school or the local authority. I would be showing these paragraphs and asking the question, will a penalty notice change my behavior as a parent and will a penalty notice lead to improve attendance in the case of my child that those are those are the questions yeah. and i i think i think it would be very hard for a school to say yes actually because you're lazy you're the cause of this you're just keeping them at home <laughs> that's that's not you know i i think parents need to know um what this is about but it's interesting because um, and I'm not blaming individual schools. The, the problem with guidance documents is they're guidance rather than the law. Mm. So you can interpret them and also you don't have to follow them. So this is a guidance document, which is supposed to be a guiding principle. But still, some local authorities might say, well, that's the guidance. But we've decided we're issuing penalty notices. But I would still say to parents, well, challenge them. What what? What do they want to achieve from, from penalising you, from making this a legal matter? That would be that would be my question. Yeah. But that I'll brings think... us on. Sorry, Ellie, go on. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to say, I think that's where it links straight back into that culture and understanding of certain schools and where they sort of lie with it. And if it is used as a inverted commas threat to parents of that is what's going to happen, Parents and pupils are then under that sort of ongoing fear and ongoing worry of living under the what if and that could happen and the what next. And that's that's difficult because it's almost 
the complete opposite of what the guidance sort of says. Um, and I was reading a couple of sorts of things last week in terms of the want to push for a new absence code in registers. And having that new absence code potentially would help to support that culture and understanding of schools, because if there was a mental well-being specific register code that went through as authorised, then every single time that that pupil is off with that, there's no debate if they are off with anything sort of linked to mental well-being and anxiety, that code is applied. It's not going through as, oh, we're unauthorizing it today. Uh, we're going to put it down as an illness today, or we'll put it down as uh, external circumstances. It'll be authorized. They, oh, today it's actually unauthorized. Having a specific mental well-being code of absence would allow that understanding that that's what it is, um, and therefore hopefully more of that would go down as being authorised and there would be less of that difficulty that currently is being faced. Um, and I think also, interestingly, it links straight back into data and something else that was brought up through documents last week. And that actually, because mental well-being difficulties in terms of being off absent or if children are off absent due to their CERN or unmet needs, they are going down in registers and data recordings as a whole mixture between authorised illness, external circumstances, unauthorised. And actually, that's where then the data doesn't correlate or doesn't match up. And um, we've got pupils that potentially would mean it would show they are off for mental well-being reasons, or it would show that they are off for illness-based reasons or appointment-based reasons more strongly. And we'd be able to pick up on those pupils, hopefully better at a better recorded data um, and show that statistic more, more detailed, uh, where at the moment, those cases are going down as multiple things and yeah. it doesn't doesn't represent a true figure potentially no absolutely okay but then all of this points to does it not this drive for schools to say it's got to be like Dame D'Souza or you know instructed last August it's got to be 100% attendance nothing else will do and I'm always struck at how insane schools will say to parents this is a very high um, non-attendance and yet the pupil will have 86, 89, 91, 93% and I'm thinking I know I'm rubbish at maths and arithmetic but hang on a minute it's not under 50 it's actually quite high so I struggle with this but the drive the message is loud and clear if you don't go to school you won't be able to learn you won't be able to sit your exams you won't do well you won't get a job you won't have a life and this absolute drive is a hundred percent attendance irrelevant of whether you are ill or not irrelevant of whether you are going to be struggling to get into school irrelevant of whether you're going to be that child in the corridor struggling to attend lessons irrelevant of whether you are being sanctioned given pensions a hundred percent attendance and i ask myself how can people learn if their mental health is so poor? How is that possible? So come on, the pair of you, you're both in education. What is it about this 100% attendance? What is, the, what is this drive all about? I think it comes from, comes from those above. Um, and while schools will promote attendance in every single way possible, they want pupils in, they want to teach, they want to learn. Teachers are in that job because they want to make a difference to children's lives. They want to advocate that ongoing passion and drive for learning in children. And that's why a lot of people want, you know, I, I for myself have wanted to work in primary school and be a primary school teacher for as long as I can remember since about three, four years old. And having that, you know, want to be there and want to encourage others to learn and everything else. I think, you know, it's teachers want pupils in, they want them to learn, they want them to be there. They don't want the increasing gaps of learning. They're trying to teach the whole class, um, you know, at the same, obviously differentiated work for 
stagger in it for abilities. But if you have got persistent absence, you have got larger gaps in certain children's learning. It's equally difficult to play catch up. Those children fall into interventions. They're then in school earlier, staying behind after school or, you know, missing bits of assembly to come and do intervention work and play catch up. Um, but I think that main drive comes from further above. Um, it is drilled into head teachers, senior leadership teams, teachers to promote that school attendance. Um, and I suppose in many professions and jobs otherwise, you are, you go to work, you attend work whenever you are well enough to be able to attend work. But we live a very different expectation to what our children are and what the children in school are. Um, we are allowed to have days that we're off unwell. We're allowed to have time to recover from illness, from mental well-being, from a broken bone, where children are almost not given that same kind of outlook that society and adults today are. And as an adult, you've almost got that understanding that it's okay to do that. But I think the demand, expectation and pressure that is being driven to schools and driven to children is really, really different. Yeah, really different, I isn't it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you go um, for it. <laughs> I, I think, you know, my, my understanding of the Children's Commissioner was part of their role is to champion children. And it, it, it worries me because this, this figure... 100%. Well, it, it just, it's so, on the one hand, it's arbitrary, but it's not. It's been picked intentionally, but it shows complete ignorance of children, of uh, health, of child development, and of all the pressures impacting on uh, children and their families. So, of course, in any walk of life, 100% is the best you can have, isn't it? So, if you're setting a goal, you know, you could say we want 100 percent of schools to be outstanding with Ofsted. We want 100 percent of children never to have any accidents in school. We want every workplace to have 100 percent of days with no no injuries. Um, and we want every workplace in the country to have 100 percent of attendance of all their employees. You could say that because 100 percent is the best it can be. But it's nonsense because we're people, not robots. And all you really need to do is look at, well, Outside the pandemic, what what did a good year of attendance look like? What is typical of a four-year-old? What is typical of a 15-year-old? So my background before headship was teaching very young children. And I know that, um, you know, children in reception class, for example, age four and five, are much more likely to um, be ill more regularly than uh, a child who's just a few years older in year two or year three. And um, similarly, their, their, their staff sometimes are more likely to be ill. And partly that's because, you know, children start in a school, they come together from all different backgrounds and different preschools. There's all sorts of germs and they're maybe not as resilient. And I, I'm, I'm no medical expert, but I know <laughs> we get a lot of illness in a reception class, particularly in, in the autumn term. And similarly, in other year group, the autumn term is always very heavy with colds and chest infections. Um, and you'll know as a teacher what kind of normal attendance is like for your your year group in a, in a mm. standard year. It's all been completely uh, thrown by the pandemic and what's happened to us all as a consequence. But, you know, I, I, in a, you, you might have 95, 96 percent as your attendance target. But. A hundred percent isn't going to happen. And so it seems like an odd, an odd aspiration. And because of that aspiration, there's pressure. There's pressure for schools. We've got to improve. We've got to increase our attendance target because the goal is 100. And our attendance last year was 93.6. So we better have a higher goal. Um, and, and again, it takes the humanity out of, of the discussion. That, that's a, a big part of the problem. Um, Yes, and you I were just, saying last. Go on. Sorry. Go on. 
I <laughs> just that you were saying last week when we um had that meeting on Monday, we were talking about um how the schools, particularly the headships, they're under extreme pressure from Ofsted. You know, the first thing Ofsted inspectors are looking at are the attendance, and that can implicate you know the immediate decision of you know, well, that's it then, that's the status is going to be dropped because your attendance, even though you could be absolutely amazing in every other respect, if that attendance is low, that's that's it. It can be game over, really. And that, to me, is, I mean, I don't know if you want to kind of talk a little bit more about that, because obviously that's your experience, isn't it? Not mine. Yeah, I mean, I guess with, without me going off on too much of a tangent for the <laughs> non-educators, um, I, I think the point is, in, in defence of schools, we're in a very, very high-stakes situation at the moment. And many people will have seen the news in the last year. Ofsted's been in the spotlight in the, you know, since the tragic death of Ruth Perry. But their conversations, which have been going on for decades amongst educators and to put it very well to put it as concisely as possible when a school has an Ofsted inspection they're inspected on various aspects of school life you know standards of attainment children's progress the curriculum leadership safeguarding procedures all those things but attendance is a um always a hot potato in in inspection and because of the current profile around attendance in the media because of the growing numbers of children who are struggling to attend school attendance has got a really high profile but the problem for schools is um the the Ofsted inspectors um, view of the school's approach to attendance can can actually limit how a school does in an inspection in short, that means if it's decided in an inspection that your attendance figures aren't good enough or that your the way you are managing absences isn't good enough or that there are concerns around school issues relating to pupil attendance, that can result in the school not achieving a good outcome in inspection. So a requires improvement outcome or an inadequate outcome. And you know, I can tell you as a former head teacher, that's terrifying because there are so many things out of your control as a head teacher, and you can be doing amazing work. But if if on the you know if, if on the day of inspection things go a bit wrong or you can't convince the inspection team of the you know the work you've been doing, or there's some there's a line of inquiry that you can't satisfy, you you could end up ultimately not getting the, the grading that you really need and mm. the risk of that is as a head teacher you can lose your job your school if it's a local authority school can be taken over by an academic trust and i'm not passing any judgment on the the rightness or wrongness of that i'm simply saying as a head yeah you know there's these are high stakes and so you've got the children's commissioner telling you need 100 percent attendance you've got ofsted who you're accountable to who, who could determine your whole fate and the fate of your school. You've got the government with a campaign telling you that children should be in school, even if they're sick or if they've got headaches. And it's it's quite a hard place to navigate for schools. I'm, I'm being, you know, I can understand on both sides of this. We've got yeah. ourselves in a real mess because we, re we all know that children sometimes get ill. Yeah. Sometimes they shouldn't be in school. You know, at the minute, there's this really quirky situation where the government has got this Moments Matter campaign, which is not good, but they're telling us that you can basically be in school. And then on the other hand, they've issued guidance to school around measles and the dangers of measles. <laughs> and in the last week, as a parent, I've received emails from my children's three different schools with public health information about the risk of measles. And I look and I, I see this email and then I, I see the Moments Matter campaign. And then I think, why, how did it come to this? Yeah. Do we, do we think health is important or do we not? Yeah. <laughs> do, we think, do we think you have to be in school every day? Or do we think actually there are some times when 
you need to prioritize your health and the protection of the public. <laughs> End of rant. End of rant. So let's bring it to a close then. It's been a, an incredibly um, informative um, discussion. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you both for this. But given that this is Children's Mental Health Awareness Week, what's going wrong really? Because we've looked at so many different aspects of it. And I can't help but feel that actually we seem to be going, in Sarah Wilson's words, famous words, we're going the wrong way. We're just not getting it right. We're not listening to the young person. We're not listening to the parents. We're not listening to the schools who are trying to be supportive. And we don't have the resources. Am I missing things out? You know, is there anything that you feel we should be considering as well? I mean, I, I think... You've covered a lot of bases. The, the, the elephant in the room <laughs> is, is COVID and the pandemic. Right. <laughs> and, you know, that's probably a topic for a whole other conversation. But whole I'm other conversation, to, yeah. I'm speaking to you as someone who has lost most of, most of what he had because of COVID. Uh, um, I've lost my health, my fitness, my income, uh, my financial security, uh, my career. Uh, two years with health that's been destroyed by COVID. And I think back to four years ago when the pandemic arrived and we were told to stay safe, don't go out, stay indoors, look after your loved ones, uh, wear, wear a mask if you do have to go out, don't, don't see family, don't see friends, um, school's not safe, work's not safe, you can't go outside. And that was four years ago. And now we're still in the pandemic in my view. I won't go off too much on this, but we've still got COVID. The only, the only thing that changed is that many people are vaccinated. But, um, you know, we don't wear masks generally. There are no mitigations in anywhere. Life kind of picked up as normal, the old yeah. normal. And in my view, we've got children in schools who just are constantly ill, who are... They've got weakened immune systems. They're sharing their germs because they're told to go to school. We've got staff in schools, but more widely in society and workplaces where their employers tell them they, they can be in work with COVID. So we're spreading a, a virus. Mm -hmm. But some people say it's just a cold. Some people say it's a virus. It's a virus and it can be very, very damaging. And one of the factors behind all of this is a lot of people just aren't very well. There's, there's low level illness. There's a, an inability. I mean, all the teachers I know, constantly ill. Yeah. Uh, my wife works in a primary school. My own four children, constantly ill. They're, yeah. You know, you go into a classroom, everybody's coughing. Um, and that's just, that's one aspect. So I better not go off on too much of a tangent. <laughs> but, um, we're living in a time where a lot of children are struggling. And some children have always struggled. It's, it's just, that's humanity. In every school, it doesn't matter whether you're in a disadvantaged catchment or a more affluent catchment. We talk a lot about poverty, but we actually need to talk more generally sometimes about children because health is everybody. Well-being is everybody. Mental health is everybody. Yeah. And we're finding that there are more children struggling in general, not just to attend school, but in general with life. And that had begun to happen before the pandemic. There were more safeguarding incidents. There were more child protect. There were more families in child protection cases. There were more... Yeah. And we were seeing more challenging behavior. We were seeing yeah. more dysregulated children. And all of this had started to happen before the pandemic even arrived. Yes. And then we've had four years of turbulence and uh, instability, uncertainty, challenge. Some families have lost their livelihoods. Some families split up. Some, some people lost loved ones. But my own children, they saw their dad go from being fit and healthy to you know, not being able to get out of bed. Um, and 
So people have been profoundly changed by the pandemic. Yes. And at the very same time as all of this, if you look at politics, the money has been dwindling with every passing year. Mm. More and more schools have gone into deficit budgets. Mm -hmm. Schools often have got a really, you know, that they've got their hearts, that they're, they're, they're wanting to be more inclusive, they're wanting to be more supportive, but they're seeing huge numbers of children struggling, an increase in the number of children being di diagnosed with additional needs. And all of these things are factors. But at the very time, there are more children than ever struggling. There's less money. There's less a recruitment money. problem. There aren't enough teachers. So there's a higher turnover of support uh, of supply staff. Um, it can be difficult to recruit the pastoral teams. Um, there's less resource, more strain. There's more pressure on schools from Ofsted, from the government, from the DfE. Uh, there's greater accountability and simply there are too many children we've got to a point where there are so many children struggling the you know the nhs can't keep up schools can't keep up yeah and if you think about it it would be like saying well um you know if suddenly the number of uh, children in the country who who were um diagnosed with um diabetes or cancer or any condition if, if those numbers increased in the way that mental health increased of course any system would struggle they would collapse under the weight of expectation yeah. because yeah. you can't you can't respond um with with the correct infrastructures there are other factors such as we've lost children's centers um we've lost school nurse teams we've lost um you know, services and infrastructures which did incredible work mm. and they some of them in some places simply don't exist. Yeah. And then a, a, a final point, which um, I think needs saying, in terms of education, we're in really interesting times in education and politics is again relevant. Um, you know, the, the current government celebrate certain types of schools so at secondary level you've got the Michaela school and a head teacher who's regarded as Britain's strictest head teacher and um, there are other schools of that mold there's a behavior Tsar who has a certain philosophy and there are things like um, you know, silencing corridors, mm. punishments for holding your hand up at the wrong angle because it's not quite what the school rule says, um, schools where the uh, isolation booths look like something out of the 1950s. Um, there are things which, and, and this is my view and, and each to their own, but I think some of the philosophies of secondary education are not my philosophy of secondary education. And it's my view that lots of children are struggling simply with the expectation of the setting. And I'm not interested in criticizing individual schools or heads, you know, it's a challenging job to run a school. But I look and what I see is, if you look at the numbers, there's a disproportionate number of children whose mental health um, wobbles and yeah. becomes a problem at secondary age. Yeah. And I think within all the discussions, we have to look at culture, expectation. And, you know, it, it might be possible to say, look, these children are sitting in silence. Therefore, they're safe. They're working hard. Look at their look at their progress. Eight, look at our school's progress eight scores. Look at our look at our amazing GCSE results. But you're not seeing what's happening internally. You're not right. seeing what's happening at home. And I think. That's just one of the many, many reasons why children are struggling. Um, yeah. I think in some areas, the gap and the change from primary to secondary education is seismic and, it, and it's a problem. Yes, yeah. Ellie, do you want to have any final thoughts? 
I hope you can hear me. We have unfortunately got some really noisy builders that have just started next door. Um, that's why I went on to mute, just so that hopefully it didn't interrupt too, too much. Um, no, I think really useful in terms of everything that Steve's talked about through the whole thing. And importantly, just there in terms of, you know, even how that early support and services that were lost through that COVID bit. Um, I was reading an article the other day in terms of, some of those babies that were born in that time went to no um, sort of baby groups, no toddler groups. Some of those babies hadn't seen another baby for such a significant amount of time. Those parents, mums and dads, lacked the early years support from health visitor appointments, potential reduce in midwife appointments, access to children's centers, access to toddler groups where you can share that like-mindedness and bounce support off of each other. Mm. Um, and the impacts from COVID are still ongoing in terms of how it impacts everybody in terms of where they are. Um, and I think, you know, there's a big drive at the moment in terms of having that early support, early identification, uh, training and understanding amongst services and working collaboratively together um, to best try and support those pupils, best try and support those families and try and make that sort of change. And I think, you know, Children's Mental Health Week being this week, their theme this year is under the child's voice. And that child's voice being a really big part of working collaboratively. That child needs to be heard. Um, we need to listen. And hopefully, you know, that collaboration working together will help to be one small step forward in mm -hmm. making a difference, I suppose. Yeah. Well, that certainly seems to be what um, we're, we're, we're feeling is a need, is a definite need but obviously there are so many things that we've highlighted today that actually make that sometimes really quite challenging um i'm sure there is plenty 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 of other things that we could go into far more depth but obviously there is only so much we can take in as as a person sort of listening to what we've talked about today i think could I, could I just mention one other thing sorry you go for it you go for it Hopefully, this will be something practical to help parents listening. So um, I mentioned the document earlier, working together. Uh, yes. I couldn't quite find the paragraph I wanted when we were talking previously, but I think this will really help. This is around how absences are coded at school level. Right. And this comes, this section is on pages 58 onwards of the documents. I'm just going to read you what... Uh, one of the paragraphs says, two of the paragraphs actually, so paragraph 219, schools should advise parents to notify them on the first day the child is unable to attend due to illness. So this is the DfE saying to schools, your job, you need to tell parents that they have to tell you on the first child day of a child's uh, illness. Schools must record absences, must, it says must, Schools must record absences as authorised where pupils cannot attend due to illness. Brackets, both physical and mental health related. End of sentence. Wow. Schools must record absences as authorised where pupils cannot attend due to illness. Now, I did say earlier this is currently not statutory, but it's due to become statutory as in legal in September. And that, that guidance says that yeah, the absence should be coded as authorised. And of course, if it's authorised, there can't be a penalty notice because yeah. it's accepted. The, yeah. the next paragraph builds on that. Paragraph 220. In the majority of cases, a parent's notification that their child is ill can be accepted without question or concern. <clears throat> It doesn't say always, it says in the majority of cases. Schools should not routinely request that parents provide medical evidence to support illness. Schools should not routinely request that parents provide medical evidence to support illness. Schools are advised not to request medical evidence 
unnecessarily as it places additional pressure on health professionals, mm. their staff mm. and their appointments, particularly if the illness is one that does not require treatment by a health professional. Only where the school has a genuine and reasonable doubt about the authenticity of the illness should medical evidence be requested to support the absence. Interesting. That's so interesting. Goodness me. Okay. Thank you both so very, very much. I'm very grateful to you. Today, if you um, came in late to this, um, I've been um, joined by guest Steve Bladen and Ellie Matthews. And I'm very grateful to you both. Um, we will be revisiting certain aspects with a couple of other hopeful um, uh, online podcasts as well as um, online um, video, um, which will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Thank you once again.